Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's One Million by One Million Strategy Roundtable for Entrepreneurs. One and One M, as you know, is the first and so far the only global virtual accelerator in the world. Our mission is to help a million entrepreneurs reach a million dollars and beyond in annual revenue and beyond build a trillion dollars in global GDP and 10 million jobs. We run this out of Silicon Valley, but we work with entrepreneurs all around the world. And this today is a very special event. It's our 300th one m one m roundtable for entrepreneurs that we do for free pretty much every Thursday. And this has been going on uh, since 2008, and it predates the One Million by One Million program in its formal incarnation. It is this set of experiments, of very early experiments with online mentoring, that led us to believe that we can actually help uh, mentor a very large number of entrepreneurs around the world. And eventually, we formalized the program in 2010 and launch one million by one million in its current incarnation. Of course, it has evolved and, and matured through the years, and and we've been here pretty much every Thursday. Just a bit of housekeeping. As usual, the event is being recorded. You will have the recording available later on on the blog as well as on our YouTube channel. If you're live tweeting the show today, please use hashtag 1M1M. Join us on Twitter at 1M by 1M and at Shromana. There's a ton of interesting content that you will find through these channels. And our YouTube channel, if you go to 1M 1M Roundtables, you will find tons and tons of these um, mentoring session recordings. And for about a year and a half, we've been doing, uh, we've been having guests as well in some of these sessions. So these are pretty interesting, uh, informative sessions that you will learn a lot from. If you like to learn from podcast type of uh, medium, this is a very nice medium to just listen to these roundtables and immerse yourself in the spirit of entrepreneurship and innovation. You will meet people from all over the world, and, and it's quite fascinating, actually, just to learn from these. These are the call-in instructions, and I will put them up um, when we are ready for call-ins. We do have a few people um, who are going to be doing some catching up and some people who are going to be doing formal pitches and so on and so forth. So we have some programming for you, um, not so different from our regular programming, but at the same time, slightly special. Um, so you will, uh, you know, once we go through that, we will turn this on, um, the, the call-in number will be available and you can dial in and we can discuss whatever it is that you would like to discuss. So I want to say a few things before we uh, open up the line and, and talk to other people who are, who are going to be talking today. You know, for me, this has been an incredible journey and it, this journey begins uh, not six years ago when we launched One Million by One Million, but it goes back actually almost 10 years when I started writing the blog. The blog was started in, in 2005, April, and I started doing Entrepreneur Journeys interviews and case studies at the end of 2006. That's when my thoughts on you know, making the tribal knowledge of Silicon Valley portable and accessible to entrepreneurs all around the world started coagulating. And of course, it has gone through many, many, many uh, layers of thought and um, improvement and enhancement. And today, what you see is a much more mature, much better thought through uh, program that uh, we have been running. In fact, very recently, we have launched yet another offering in the program, which is the one and one in basic. I'll talk about that later in the program. But um, in terms of what I have learned, you know, I have talked to over 700 successful entrepreneurs in doing these case studies, in developing the curriculum, and I've talked to 
you know, thousands and thousands of entrepreneurs in the coaching mode, and I've learned what kinds of issues you are encountering, what kind of issues are roadblocks for you. This, you know, two-sided learning of what are the issues of entrepreneurs and how successful entrepreneurs have mitigated those issues. I've taken the questions that I have encountered in, in my work of mentoring entrepreneurs to some of these entrepreneurs who have solved these issues and triangulated, so to speak. And that's been an incredible learning experience for me personally. And then I've learned something that I didn't have as one of my strengths, and that's patience. I was quite an impatient person. <laughs> so the mode in which we've been doing this for so long has been, you know, in some sense, a significant spiritual development for me personally. And um, as you know, I've taken the position that I'm going to be completely direct with you in the feedback that I give you. And I will tell you what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. That is a tough position. And it is a position that earned me the reputation of being harsh. My intent is not be my intent is not to be harsh with you. It has never been to be harsh with you. My intent is to be intellectually honest. And <laughs> I have chosen to be intellectually honest with all of you as I've worked with you through all these years. And somehow, I hope today you understand and appreciate the intent of the One Million by One Million program. And there is patience, there is kindness, there is empathy, the words that I probably have the most resonance with is empathy. Um, and I hope you feel that empathy as you work with us, uh, because we have, you know, we have traveled the journey of the journey of an entrepreneur as well. We are doing this as a startup venture, as a bootstrap startup venture. We have not taken any financing. I have taken financing in my past ventures, but in this one, this is my fourth company, and we are running it out of organic um, generation, and and we've, you know. We've run a very tight sheep ship, a very lean organization, and um, I have two colleagues that I want to mention in particular, Maureen Kelly, whom many of you have worked with over the years, and Irina Patterson, whom also you have worked with over the years. These are the two people whom you directly interface with all the time in the context of these roundtables. And um, all of us have had to exercise tremendous patience and tremendous uh, resilience. And there are many other people on the 1M1M one &one &one team who are doing their parts in bringing this program to you. Um, I want to thank them. I want to appreciate them. Maureen has produced every single one of these 300 roundtables. So she deserves an applause, a resounding applause, for um, the amount of juggling that she has been able to do in bringing this to you week after week after week. So, so for us, from us, I think it's been a story of patience, it's been a story of resilience, and it has been a story of commitment. We are tremendously committed to the One Million by One Million mission, and I hope that comes through in the work that we do for you. So I want to summarize for you a few um, nuggets of our journey, stuff that have kind of come up constantly, points, advice that I have repeatedly delivered. I've written about these things, I've coached people using these methods or using these points. And um, I just want to share some of those with you to begin with, and then we're going to go into the the mentoring and pitches and updates and so forth. We have some premium members and alumni who are going to provide updates today as well, and I'm really thrilled to see them uh, here and, and catch up. I'm looking forward to catching up with them. The first thing I want to tell you is define success. You see, 
There is a cottage industry in our world called venture capital. And that cottage industry, for some reason, is defining the agenda. And they have defined the agenda that entrepreneurship equals financing and financing at crazy valuations, like you have to build billion dollar companies, blah, blah, blah. I don't buy into this definition of success. My definition of success is entrepreneurship equals customers plus revenues plus profits. Financing and exit are optional. Of course, if you take financing, you're going to need to exit your company and give return on investment in, in return on investment to the investors. But you don't have to take financing one. And if you don't take financing, exit is definitely optional. You can continue to run your business. So, so this fundamental driven approach has been the one million by one million philosophy all through. And nothing has changed on that. We started with this philosophy. That philosophy remains absolutely cardinal in our growth. The other question that has come up over and over again because of this myth and misconception in the industry that entrepreneurship equals financing, many entrepreneurs constantly rush to financing as their primary agenda. Folks, there are two key criteria for VC financing. One of them is you have to grow at a high profile rate, and you have to be working on a super large total available market opportunity. And that's we're talking in billion, multi-billion kind of opportunity. If you don't fulfill these criteria, you're not going to get VC financing. Over 99% of the entrepreneurs who go out to raise money get rejected. Please internalize this fact, factoid, truth, whatever you want to call it. But this is the way it is. It is what it is. It is not going to change because there are many, many pieces of the venture capital industry that are built upon these two assumptions of high profile growth and super large TAM. Now, billion dollar TAM is rare. It's very rare. There are many more $5 million, $10 million, $20 million, $50 million ideas. And if you build a $10 million company that generates 20 30% profit year over year and, you know, go on to, you know, running that business, building that business over an extended period of time, I call it a success. And you should too. Billion dollar um, business, billion dollar exit is not the only definition of success. As Mark Andreessen says, it is our job to reject. He's a venture capitalist. He's speaking for all venture capitalists. And each venture capitalist in, you know, the course of one year invests in maybe four to six deals. They see a few thousand deals a year. So you can do the math. You're mostly technical people. You can do the math. This is what they do. You can't blame them for that. Their job is to find certain types of companies. So, and they're working with a portfolio, you're not. We had this extensive discussion about this in the last session with Heidi Royson, that you are, this is your life. This is my life. This is every one of your life. You are doing one venture at a time. And if, if that venture fails and if you have to write off so many years of your life, that is a real problem. You're not, you don't have a portfolio across which you can succeed. You have to succeed with one venture. So you better be very careful in the choices and the decisions you make in that one venture. The other philosophy that we have institutionalized in one million by one million is bootstrap first, raise money at all, uh, raise money later, if at all. And that really is the one in one mantra. We have seen this succeed over and over again. Um, if you get to a certain level of validation and you can show TAM, you can show that there's a path to fast growth, you will be able to raise money. More or less, we know 
what works, we don't we know what doesn't work. There are other nuances, but these are if if we can get to a certain level of validation showing that these assumptions will yield a fast growth large term business, there's a decent amount of chance that you will be able to raise money. But to get there, as many of our entrepreneurs have experienced in the one on one program itself and of course entrepreneurs at large have experienced, and I think there is more awareness and more understanding of this issue in the industry today than there was 10 years ago, that you have to bootstrap, and this phase can go for a long time. Bootstrapping phase can go for a long time until you hit those, hit your stride, so to speak, where VCs will engage and will invest. So keep that in mind. And of course, you know, there are certain businesses that are operating on small term niche opportunities that are not going to be financeable, but they're perfectly okay to build in a bootstrap mode, and we will support you in that. And we stand by that message. It is not the philosophy of most accelerators in the world. They're all operating as feeders into the venture capital industry. We don't. We have our share of venture funded companies, but we we don't require that you become venture funding worthy as a metric for success. Um, one of my recent heroes is Linda Weinman. Linda bootstrapped Linda.com to significant revenue, raised a mezzanine round of private equity funding, and then sold to LinkedIn for $1.5 billion. This company was not built in Silicon Valley. It was built near Ojai, California, near um, Santa Barbara. It was off center. It didn't get caught up in any of the VC hype, anything. And it's a classic story of bootstrap first, raise money later. And then, you know, it's a fantastic exit. LinkedIn is a great company. And uh, I, you know, we partner very closely with LinkedIn on multiple fronts these days. Um, and there are very strong platform for us uh, in terms of collaboration. And I'm really thrilled to see a, an entrepreneur and, and a woman entrepreneur at that who has had the nerve to turn down venture financing. Because once you get to a point, by the way, where you are generating significant amounts of money, revenue-wise, and you have good validation, good market traction, investors start chasing you. So it does require a lot of nerve and a lot of center to be able to turn down that money, and Linda did. So, so it's, it's great that this success happened, and this is just one case, by the way. In our you know, 700 plus case studies, there are numerous, numerous, numerous stories of bootstrap first, raise money later success stories. I've shared at different forums many of these stories. So. Um, it is a mantra that is working, and I would like you to internalize it and remember it as you go along. There's another myth that I want to bust right here and now, and I've been writing about this extensively. The myth is you have to quit your job to start a company. This is false. There's a lot of companies that have succeeded because they didn't go out of business by running out of cash. They started with a day job, they started validating on the side, and they got to validation, then quit the job and, and went full time with the companies. We have companies in our portfolio that are bootstrapping with a paycheck. We are very happy to support you in that mode. Almost no other incubator owner or accelerator other than One Million by One Million will work with you if you are bootstrapping a company with a paycheck. We will. We always will, I firmly believe, that this is a fantastic way to bootstrap. The other one, the other myth, is services companies are not interesting. This is false. Bootstrapping product companies using services works great. We have numerous case studies of this working. And again, we will always support this method of bootstrapping as well. And, you know, huge companies like Oracle did exactly this, by the way. You know, Larry Ellison found out while consulting for an enterprise customer, there were certain needs that he knew how to solve, and he basically went ahead and bootstrapped Oracle using services. 
The other myth is lifestyle businesses aren't sexy. You know, I have done businesses both ways. I've done businesses with venture capital and without venture capital. And I'll tell you one thing that I really appreciate, and, and it is probably my major definition of success, is the fact that I'm completely independent. No one dictates how fast I need to grow my business. No one dictates what I do with my time. No one dictates what our team does, what our team focuses on. We do that ourselves. We do not have to report to some external entities. And it allows, a certain, allows me a certain control over my time, which I really like. Um, for example, last December, last November, December, right around the Thanksgiving holiday, I decided to spend three weeks traveling around London, Vienna, Prague, Budapest, mostly listening to classical music, watching a lot of theater, going to a lot of museums, looking at a lot of architecture and art. And that's just my choice. I don't have to answer to anybody. I don't have to apologize to anybody. And I think that, to me, is a definition of success, that I do exactly what I feel like doing. So I would like to point that out to you. Making huge amounts of money for investors is not my definition of success. And, and I've, this time around, I have chosen not to take investors. So I have the luxury of doing exactly what I want to do and how I want to do. And this is a great, um, you know, byproduct, a great perk of doing bootstrap businesses where you're not answerable to other people. You really do get to be your own boss. Now, I'm a very tough boss on myself. So it's not like I'm not working for a boss and I'm not working for a tough boss because I am very tough on myself, but that's different. The other myth is VC-funded entrepreneurs make more money. This is not true at all. More equity you have in your business, if you exit your company, the more wealth you're going to create. So let's look at this cartoon. You may have seen this before. There's a, this is a scene in a coffee shop. Jim and Sarah are having a little conversation, standing in the line for coffee. Sarah says, hey, Jim, what have you been up to? Hi, Sarah, I just sold my business. It took me five years to build it. What a coincidence. I, too, just sold my business. Sure, lots of great investors funded me. I ended up owning 5% in the end, says Jim. Sarah says, well, Jim says we sold it for a whopping $100 million, so now I have $5 million in the bank. And now they're leaving the coffee shop, and Sarah is thinking, hmm, I sold mine for just $25 million, but I didn't have any investors. But come to think of it, I'm glad I didn't. I have $25 million in the bank now. And Jim is horrified. So, Simple math, go do the math, and this math applies every time around. And then the big myth in this last couple of years, so the market goes in cycles, as you know. Um, and I'm you know, old enough to have seen a few of these cycles, including the dot-com cycles, and I was in the middle of it. I was, I was a startup CEO in the middle of the dot-com boom, and I was a startup CEO in the middle of the dot-com bust. So, We've seen many of these cycles. We see, we've seen nuclear winter in Silicon Valley. We've seen, um, you know, we've also seen the last two, three years of unicorn mania. And everybody now wants to build a unicorn. And then there's this myth that unicorns cannot be bootstrapped. Well, that's not true either. You know, if you read my Billion Dollar Unicorns book, there are several case studies, and the three that I particularly love and I included in that book are Zoho, eClinical Works, and Veeam. All three are over $300 million a year in revenue companies 
completely bootstrapped. And then, you know, if you have a $300 million in revenue SaaS company, your valuation is well over $3 billion. What, you cannot build a bootstrapped unicorn? That's bullshit, right? We raised money um, towards the end. And still remains private, though. They're not planning to exit. They've created a dividend structure with their uh, investor. Uh, even though they have raised money, they don't want to exit, and they're not going to exit. Instead, they're going to pay dividends um, to their investors. That's another way of doing things. And of course, you know, you've heard me talk a lot about right now, Greg Gianforte in Montana, Tableau Software, uh, Christian Chabot. These are fabulous, fabulous companies that were bootstrapped first, raised money later. Right now, um, raised its first round of finance with $6 million in revenue. Until then, it bootstrapped. And its first round financing valuation was $130 million. Eventually, right now, went public. And then Oracle bought it for, I think, about $1.3 billion. Tableau is a very successful public company. Uh, also bootstrapped in the beginning. Um, Christian did a small kind of 18-month startup before that that was acquired. It didn't make a huge amount of money, but made some money, enough to be able to bootstrap Tableau. And then Tableau did super, super, super well. But by the time Tableau went to raise its first round of financing, it had significant revenue, tons of customers, a couple of hundred customers, an OEM deal with, um, with Hyperion, and so forth. So it was when it raised money, it raised money at a, at a $20 million valuation, Series A, $20 million valuation. At the time, you know, it was the, the average Series A would be $5 million. So these are people that you should take very seriously. And these are people whose footsteps I would like you to follow in and find your success learning the wisdom and, and the maneuverings of their journeys. This is why we do entrepreneur journeys, so that we can learn from what people have done, how they've done what they've done, and how they've maneuvered. Now, um, we've also very strongly believed that self-assessment is important. We've tried to give you tools with which you can self-assess. We've tried to teach you methodology, and we've tried to help you Learn things enough so that you can also self-assess where you stand, you know, what are, the stat what are the nuances of your business and how would investors look at those things. So please remember self-assessment is really important. Are you fundable or do you need to bootstrap some distance all the way? What, what kind, what is the status of your positioning? Do, are, do you have a positioning nailed down? Go to the 1M1M one one website, and there's a free 1M1M one one self-assessment. That is one of the most visited pages on our website. Entrepreneurs all over the world are using this page, the self-assessment, on a daily basis. So definitely use that. Ask these questions of yourselves. And if you need help, come talk to me here. Um, if you, you can also go do the basic curriculum and plug your knowledge gaps in this, uh, you know, in answering these questions. If you have difficulty answering these questions and you need to learn methodology, you can go do, go do that. You, now we offer the curriculum separately as, not just as part of the premium program, but also as part as a one-on-one -on -one -on basic. So you can just do the curriculum and, and get there as well. So those are kind of my, um, you know, nuggets and, um, Wisdom gathered, I guess, from all these years of working with you all and working with the entrepreneurs whose case studies light our way. Um, we're going to switch to the next phase of the conversation, and we're going to talk to entrepreneurs, as usual. Um, now, for those of you who have not pitched at one of these sessions before, I want to set some expectations. Look, we are completely on your side. There is absolutely no other agenda here other than wanting to see you succeed. So this is a working session. 
We're going to be giving you feedback, etc., our perspective. And, you know, it's completely with that intent of helping you hear what is it that you need to hear and what, um, what might help you. So, as you can imagine, we've accumulated a tremendous amount of knowledge here. And the perspectives of over 700 entrepreneurs are available for you to accelerate your business with. And that's the perspective with which we are coming to you with our feedback. That doesn't mean that you cannot disagree with us. Whatever you get here today, whatever you hear today, you can discard. It's your business. It's your life. It's your business. You can discard. It's not a problem. <laughs> and if you're not pitching, please participate by asking questions in the public chat, and also I'll open up the uh, line to, for you to dial in with questions. Um, this is a roundtable, so we want everybody to participate as much as possible. We want to hear from you. We want to hear who you are, you know, introductions, etc. So we're going to start today with Steve Owens. Steve is a 1M1M one &one Premium uh, alumni. He's been in the program for several years. We've worked with him for over a period of several years, and I know his business intimately. Uh, but I haven't had an update in a while, and Steve will tell you about his business and also uh, help me catch up on what things are, where things are, how are things going. And I'm thrilled to have you here, Steve. Hi, Germana. Thank you for uh, having me at your 300th uh, event. It's My great uh, quite pleasure. an honor. And thank you for all your advice over the years. It's been great. Um, What's going on? So tell I, guess us. I guess I'll just uh, tell Maureen when to switch the slides. Will that work? Uh, yeah, tell me. I'll, I'll switch the slides. Now, make sure you set the context for everybody in the room. I know your business, but a lot of others don't. So, uh, sure. So let's make sure that you let I, I everybody think the know. First, first slide might help do that. So if we can just go to that slide. Okay, so we're a product development company. Uh, we're a little different than a lot of product development companies in that we only work for small companies. So these are small companies that are in a niche market or they're startups. Um, and we provide them the product engineering from requirements all the way through to uh, 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 pilot production. Uh, next slide, please. And you do that in a very specific area, which has now become very sexy, but you've been doing it for a while, and under the name Machine to Machine, but now the, the terminology yeah. of Internet of Things has really Inter become Internet added a lot of sexy to, to right, your business. Right, it, That is the, the newest and greatest word, IoT, Internet of Things. You're correct. <laughs> but when we started, there wasn't even a name for it. We used to call it remote monitoring, but strange how things like that change. Um, so when we started, when we started engaging with you, uh, we really had three goals. You know, one was to find this unique uh, selling position. Uh, there's lots of competition out there. There's lots of people who call them product development company. There's even a lot of people that say that they're in this IoT space. Um, so we had to differentiate ourselves. We had to position ourselves uh, so that the right kind of clients would seek us out. Uh, the other thing we tr were trying to do was increase our elasticity. Um, because we're in a service business and because of the way product development works, we can have too much work one month and not enough work uh, in, a, in you know, the next month. Mm -hmm. And the final thing we had to do was to generate a repeatable sales and marketing system. We were suffering from, oh, we're too busy to do anything, and then six months, well, where's all the customers? It takes six months to... Uh, get a customer into the funnel and get them down to a close. So those were the three initiatives that we were uh, focused on back in 2014. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so our unique selling position, you know, is small companies. So these are small companies that are in niche markets or they're, uh, you know, startups. Uh, we believe we're unique in that we comply. We we uh, have a complete team not just a task. So 
So we can literally take you from product idea to now you're in production. Uh, we have a very unique process that's really tailored to smaller companies. Uh, there's many product development companies out there that mostly work for much larger organizations who don't have some of the unique problems. Uh, a lot of them you mentioned in your introduction there. Uh, and we have unique resources. And what I mean by that is uh, we have a lot of reference designs that allow us to do product development very quickly and very cheaply. Uh, so we're taking blocks and redoing them over and over again, and the sort of the way we structure ourselves and how we, uh, the people we hire, and how they work together, and especially how they work together with uh, other resources around the world and around the country is is a unique thing. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so how did we increase uh, elasticity? And what I mean by elasticity is, again, the ability to have a lot of revenue one month and actually get it done and get it done correctly and you know of quality, but not starve to death the next month. And we did that largely by uh, building a uh, resource network of other engineers. Some of these are freelancers. Some of these are other product development companies. Uh, some of them are in the United States. Some are in India. They're all over the world. Uh, we put together a process for sort of vetting these people, figuring out how to work with them, figuring out how to get them to work under the finish line process, and then also figuring out how to quickly identify them and get them on a project when the work came in. And so that allows us to, right now we're billing 60% of our hours are billed from people who are not um, permanent full-time employees or not on our fixed cost payroll. Uh, our focus then was on this project management skill process. So most of the stuff that we internalize is on how these RPMs, our project managers, use those resources, interface with the customer, and use our processes and reference designs to actually create the work. And you know, the last thing we had to be good at was getting the discipline to feed the funnel. Um, our sales. Uh, you know, time from first contact to close is about six months. So whatever we're working on now at the beginning of the funnel is the work we're going to be doing six months from now. And in the past, we really didn't have the discipline when we were super busy to feed that funnel. And we'd suffer from it later because of that lack of discipline. And so today, we recognize that. We talk about it all the time. We force ourselves to spend the time exactly when it, it seems like we shouldn't be spending the time to uh, do that front-end work, that front-end uh, sales and marketing work. Uh, next slide. Um, so from a repeatable sales and marketing position, the first thing we did was map our sales and marketing process. Then we measured it through key performance indicators, KPIs. Then we had weekly meetings to try to figure out which things were working and which things were not working. And we hired a lot of specialists to help us resolve specific issues that we had, especially around messaging and positioning and stuff, to help us improve that sales and marketing process. Uh, and it, it's radically changed from years ago, where basically we'd wait for the phone to call. And now we largely implement a, what some people call a you know sales 3.0 uh, methodology, which is uh, content-based. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and so these were the results. This was uh, a graph of our, this is just new customers. So this is how many new customers we got on a weekly basis. So this graph starts at that uh, January 2000 level and goes through today. And um, you know it's still a little wiggly, but it's a lot more consistent than it was in the past. If you would have seen uh, the past graph of this, it would be some months you'd get zero customers, and you know some months you'd get ten. It was not consistent, and the, the, the customer acquisition cost was about ten times what it currently is. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is a graph of our. Uh, monthly uh, uh, billable hours, so this is what we're billing every month. You can see we went from you know being in the sort of thirty to fifty thousand dollar range and have have been quickly ramping up to uh, almost ten times that amount now. Um, so we've we've grown pretty substantially. We still have you know too much variability in our revenue, but that's not affecting our profitability as much as it used to because of the the, the you know the outsourcing that we've done ourselves. 
uh, having these uh, people that we can bring in and off the project, you know, quickly and then have them uh, leave when they're no longer needed has helped tremendously in making sure that See, we what you're showing here in, on this graph is um, revenue on a monthly basis and, and because right. your business is, has this characteristics of a consulting business, it has this kind of variability, but if you if you look at it more on a on an annual basis, probably it looks very different, right? Right. We um, we almost doubled last year. So if you look on it a year to year basis, our revenue almost doubled, and it was and it would had doubled from the year before that as well. And and you're right. If we did even a three month moving average on this graph, it would look a lot smoother. Yeah. Uh, we like to plot it this way, though, because that's been a problem for us in the past, right, is we get a lot of work yeah. and then we don't have any, and we get a lot of work and we don't have it, and we've had a goal to sort of minimize that. Well, and as you mentioned, you've, you've been working on smoothening out this curve, and, and you, have, you, are, you have been paying attention to a systematic repeatable sales process, the funnel, right. and, and feeding the top of the funnel on a regular basis and all of those things. So those are methods that are focused on smoothening this graph out. Right, right. Okay, what, um, what now? What, uh, what are the key issues that are coming up at this point? So your numbers have been good. You've doubled for the last couple of years revenue-wise. Now, where, um, where are the key challenges these days? Um, we we have two key challenges. The first one is is to tr trying to find uh, qualified people to work in the business. Um, this has been extremely difficult. We've had several missteps. Uh, we we've hired the wrong people and or spent a lot of time, energy, and money and not found anybody at all. Um, and the other thing that we're trying to do a better job of, and it's just because we know we can, is getting more efficient internally. We're starting to have, you know, getting big enough that uh, people don't know about something and they should know about it because this person doesn't talk to this person. So we're trying mm -hmm. to put the right kind of processes and systems in place so that those that kind of communication can happen because it, it allows us, again, to be more competitive and to, you know, do the product development quicker, better, cheaper than than we could if we didn't know about that kind of information internally. Steve, are you all in one place? All of the uh, the, the full time employees are in one place, but again, and we manage uh, the requirements and conceptual design. We never outsource that part of the thing. But the detailed design, which is writing code or laying out a board or designing a circuit. We will outsource that part of it to lots of people around the world. So the, that's what the project managers do: is they do the systems work, then they break it up mm -hmm. into individual tiny bite-sized pieces, and then using our database of these people that we've vetted and have trained on how to use our system, uh, they then farm it out to those individuals. And some of those individuals are, most of them are in India or the U.S. Those are the two largest. Uh, there's a few people elsewhere, but there's a large concentration of qualified engineers in India and, and, of course, the U.S. as well. So the trend of building, you know, virtual teams is very, very strong right now. Um, people are, uh, and it's on twofold. It's actually virtual teams and freelance teams are both um, are big trends right now, where you have. In, in case of freelancers, you have some flexibility or, and you can bring people in project by project. And in terms of virtual teams, you have you know, access to people across the world as opposed to just in one place. So I wouldn't right. think of it purely as outsourcing, but more as this kind of or, you know, building a virtual company. Like we run a virtual company. It's not like we're right. not working full time, but we, we do have yeah. a virtual company that has uh, team members from all over the world with dedicated assignments, dedicated, you know, responsibilities. But right. this, this team is sourced from all over the world. Correct. Yeah, and we have over 150 people that we've put through our system and are in our database and are, you know, qualified to do work for us. And you're right that that word outsourcing to some people has a negative connotation. It's sort of viewed as you just yeah, and, and you need to build. Um, you need to build these relationships, um, you know, 
with people around the world so that they become reliable virtual team right. members. Um, yeah. And and it works phenomenally well. I, as all yeah. my team members will yeah. attest, we have, we have been working phenomenally right. well, yeah, phenomenally we, productively we, for a long time. We've traveled to all these places, including India, just just for that purpose. Gone there to meet them and you know talk to them, and and they have been here to our facility as well. So we we have spent a, a lot of energy building those relationships and making sure that we understand how to communicate with these people and you know bring them into the fold, so to speak. And it, it is very important. You can't just call somebody up and say, do this. That just doesn't work. They really have to feel like they're part yeah. of the team, be part of the team, understand how the team works and what the processes are, et cetera, et cetera. So. Great. All right, Steve, thank you for the update. I'm thrilled that your okay. revenue numbers have continued to double every year and, and uh, that processes are starting to come together. And, um, and we wish you all the very best. Thank you, and thank you for all your help. Pleasure. Ajit, you're up next. Hi, Samana. It's been a while Hello, since Ajit. we spoke. And uh, congratulations, Samana. It's so fantastic to see the, the you hit this milestone of 300. You must be thrilled. I certainly am. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I'm still tired, exhilarated, all of those. <laughs> yes. Yes, I can imagine. I, I've been working with you now since, I think, 2010. Uh, that was when we first met, and it's been six years. <laughs> I almost feel yes. like this is a part of my journey. <laughs> yep, yeah. yep. You've been, you've been with us from the very beginning, and I am thrilled to see what's happening. So let's, let's actually go into your, uh, your story. Sure. And, and by the way, folks, Ajit, um, Ajit has been in the program for a long time. Uh, he started back in 2011, and I actually met Ajit personally back uh, when I was uh, doing a workshop in Chennai. I think it was in 2011 itself, and uh, and first learned about his work uh, around autism and language learning and so forth. So that work has evolved tremendously. I believe he's doing very important work. And um, and I, it's been a real pleasure to be a part of your journey, Ajit. So I'm I'm looking forward to catching up. Tell us what's going on. Okay, so I'll give you a very short um, overview of what we do, some background. Uh, we started off as a company that was trying to make apps for kids with autism, and particularly apps that help them with uh, communication and learning speech and language. So children with autism have a problem with understanding spoken language and written language because they have a certain level of abstraction. Essentially, your brain is decoding random sounds into meaning, um, and children with autism often have a problem with that. So the way that we built communication tools for kids with autism is that we were working with uh, pictures. So instead of making, instead of having language be fuzzy in the form of, um, in the form of in the form of words, um, it's much more concrete in the form of pictures. And um, so that's, that's really the starting point of my journey with investigating the um, underlying uh, processes and the underlying science of language and communication. Now, in the process of working with kids with autism, um, which of course, Shramana has been uh, tremendously helpful in guiding our journey. And uh, about a year and a half ago, in 2014, we raised a seed round of funding a little more than half a million dollars. And um, we used that to build out the Avas business, and that's now stabilized, and um, we, are, we are making a huge amount of impact over the world. But what has also happened in the course of that time is that we came up with this incredible new invention called free speech. And free speech is not just uh, a tool for autism. It is a way to put pictures together to actually represent meaning and an algorithm that converts that algorithmically into any language. So you can use pictures to compose any sentence, and you can use a free speech engine to convert that into any language. So it really is um, a way to communicate across language barriers with pictures. We've seen a lot of traction around free speech, not in the autism space, but in the general language education space. Sometimes connected with special education, sometimes not. Sometimes connected with second language learning. Um, on the basis of some of this traction, Shramana, um, I, I, I've seen a great deal of momentum in the last one month 
And now mm -hmm. we are ready to hit the market again for funding. And that is the specific update that I wanted to give you today. Uh, I put okay. together a deck okay. that I am shopping around with investors. I've met a few of them. I'm planning to meet a few more. But I would love to get your feedback about this deck and um, how the business looks as a venture fundable business and any other thoughts that you might have about this. Okay. Okay. So um, this is the crux of what we're doing. You know, our, our brain processes language and, and, and uh, decodes language really quickly, but actually when we speak sentences, there's tons and tons of meaning that is coded in that. It's hard to, it's hard to realize that when it's a language that you know, but even if you, if you looked at these examples on the right side, you can see at a glance that it's very hard to decode languages that you don't know. On the other hand, the next slide, please. The, can you go to the next slide, please? Yeah. On the other hand, if you look at pictures, um, pictures are universal. You know, you can communicate with pictures across language boundaries. And C speech is this way of composing sentences with pictures. You can see that the crux of it is really this arrangement in the form of these question answer maps that you can put together in order to connect pictures to each other. And that is the free speech representation. And there is a very, um, there is a very advanced proprietary algorithm that we've developed that uses a lot of AI and, and NLP and linguistics to convert this free speech representation into perfectly grammatical sentences in any language. So that is the crux of what we do. Um, the next slide, please. So typically at this stage, I, I do a demo for the investors. Um, the demo is actually a pretty interesting demo. The way that it works is that you have the free speech app and you have all of these different words in the app in English. But when you start putting them together, um, very unexpectedly really, the app starts speaking out in Chinese. So you are constructing sentences in English, uh, ostensibly in English, but there is perfectly grammatical Chinese that's coming out. And this is a, I, I, I like to tell my investors that, you know, you, you started speaking in Chinese moments after I've given you this app. So this is really allowing you to communicate really in, in minutes uh, to develop some Chinese expertise. Um, I don't, I'm not going to show the demo now, obviously, but um, that, that is what we do. And, and I, I'd, I'd be glad to send you a code to look at it as well, Shamana. Um, okay. So, so um, we've been positioning free speech as a language learning, language development app. The app uh -huh. that is on the market was launched one month ago, in, in, the, in the, towards the end of February. In that one month, we've had 2,000 paying customers. The app is priced at $10, more than $20,000 in revenues. And best of all, Apple named us their number one best new app. Right, and that's not just in education, not just in special education, but in the entire, across all categories, the entire app store all over the world. So that was a huge awesome. moment of pride for me and my team. <laughs> totally yeah. awesome. I fell off the chair when I saw that. I was thrilled, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I think the point that I want to emphasize there, Shamana, is that it was not a one-off. We've been working really hard at building a strong relationship with Apple. We've been in, in touch with them over the last six or seven months. Um, yep. On yep. We've been showing them free speech. We've been explaining what our vision is for the app. We've been discussing with them how to get it on new platforms that they are promoting, how to tie it, tie it in with initiatives in, in education that they're oh. coming up with. Oh. And they are very excited about our roadmap as well. And they have offered to support us in a number of different ways that I think is, a, is, a, is definitely a very unfair advantage for us. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, um, Ajit, one question here. Um, you are using a $9.99 pricing, and um, and this is a one-time pricing, right? It's not a monthly it subscription. It is a one-time download pricing, yeah? That's correct, yes. yes. What's the thinking behind this pricing? I think um, for this first app that we released, Ramana, um, the idea was really to test whether product market fit exists. So I, I would yeah. say that we didn't just give a great deal of thought to what the pricing ought to be. I'm pretty convinced, so during the time that Apple featured us, one of the experiments that we did is that we dropped the price by 50%, so we priced it at $5. And we found that the, uh -huh. the, the down numbers actually doubled. So we are uh -huh. on the upper curve <laughs> in some sense. Uh, we, uh, we did find that um, there is that price elasticity and people do buy it if it's, if it's cheaper. 
Now, yeah. uh, I'm going to be explaining what our primary market is. And I, I think um, in the markets that we are looking at uh, in, in, in Asia primarily, I'm, I'm pretty convinced that we have to go free with in-app purchases or in-app subscriptions. And so the approach that we're going to be doing is to give it away for free and to charge either a subscription or, uh, or a, you know, price per lesson or something like that. Hmm. That adds a whole range of complexity into the business angle. Yes, yes, it does. That's something we have to experiment with. Uh, this is about our technology and our platform. It is based on patented high technology, and it is built on a platform which makes it tremendously easy for us to port it across platforms. So right now, just because of the Apple relationship, we are iOS only and you know Apple only in some sense. We have it on the on the iOS platform. We have it for the Mac, and we are going to release it very shortly for the Apple TV. Um, okay. Once we view the Apple relationship to get to a certain market position, it will become very important for us to get the product to people that have other products, other other devices, and it's only a matter of days, literally, for us to bring out Android, Windows, web versions, and so on. Okay. Okay. Um, this is a competition, and here is where you know I am trying to define the market on my own terms in some sense. Remember, so there are companies. I would say there are two kinds of companies out there, and I'd like to use Duolingo as one representative, and I'd like to use this Verbling as the other representative. Now, okay. Duolingo is a completely free product, and they have 100 million users. But um, I think there are a couple of couple of problems that. I mean, um, so if you look at the market, the way that language learning apps work, first of all, um, with apps like Duolingo, you really need to invest a huge amount of time before you can start speaking the language fluently. You know, you have to learn. There is a learning curve associated with language inherently. You have to know hundreds of words before you can start having meaningful conversations, right? And mm -hmm. learning words is really very, very boring because it's just learning words by heart. There's very little logic to it. And so when you use an app like Duolingo or any of their other competitors that, that work off the same principle, it takes months, literally. And even though the app is free, the actual time that you invest is, is delivering very poor returns. And um, so on the other hand, with free speech, and I mean, this again connects with the slide where I was showing the product demo, and literally in, in seconds you can start communicating uh, very complex sentences in, in the other language. So the return on time investment is, is, is huge with, with free speech. The um, other dimension is really how you learn the language. Do you learn it through another language or do you learn it um, using the, net, the, 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 the networks in your brain that learned your first language? And um, mm -hmm. I'm not going to touch that in detail, but when you use pictures, there is evidence to show that it is much stickier and it uses those pathways instead. So we are picture-based and we are um, instantaneous returns almost. The um, other category of apps is this verb link kind of apps. Now, those apps are what I consider to be really my competition. Duolingo, uh, so the verb link kind of apps are the apps that actually tutor you to learn English. They connect you, they're a marketplace that connect you with a tutor who will talk to you and you have to pay $20 an hour or something like that to be able to get, you know, tutoring in the language that you want to learn. And they're sure. much more effective than the Duolingo of the world. I think that with technology that you have today, you know, technology in NLP, technology in machine understanding of speech, technology like mm -hmm. the bots, AI bots that people are building nowadays, conversation bots, and technology yeah. like free speech, all of that put together, we could conceivably replace a human teacher, not mm -hmm. an app, replace a human teacher with technology. We can we can we can disrupt the industry not of language apps but of language teachers, and I think that's where the money is. In in China, for example, which I think is our biggest market and the market that we are thinking of entering for the as, as our very first market, there are billion dollar companies out there that have just armies of teachers teaching Chinese. I think that market is ripe for disruption with AI, NLP, artificial intelligence technologies. And I think free speech is the first product that has ever explored those dimensions. Mm -hmm. The next slide. Um, I want to hit the Chinese market first, Ramana. I have I have three reasons for this. 
The first reason is because everybody, so I mean, obviously Asia is where the market is. 50% of the English language learning market is in Asia. But China so, has the advantage that it is, first of all, uh, everybody is learning it from the same language. Everybody's learning it from Chinese, unlike India where oh, yeah. the multiple. The second thing is this special relationship that we have with Apple, I think really yields it worth in, in, in you know, its weight in gold in China because China is a huge priority for Apple and Apple has like an yes. incredible market share. Yes. The third thing is that this I think structurally Chinese is one of the simplest languages from a grammar perspective, and that's why we have a fully working Chinese prototype. So with all of that kind of, um, you know, all, all of that considered, I want to enter the China market first. I want to use this relationship with Apple. I want to then build relationships with the other app stores, the telco, telco companies, the brick and mortar um, language learning companies. And I want to be able to use some amount of PR within China to be able to take this app um, to several hundreds of thousands of downloads and potentially mm -hmm. monetizing there. Um, okay. And then, I think and then, from a yeah. uh, prioritization and, and strategic planning point of view, it makes perfect sense. Also because you have this special relationship with Apple and China is Apple's priority and your your, China does have a very big English learning appetite, so I'm completely with you on all of those. Fantastic. All right, next slide, please. So I'm looking to raise $2 million from Anna, and um, I think that $2 million will help us with, I would say, two big things. I put down one of them here, which is essentially getting a huge market share in China, which currently doesn't have comparable apps. Um, to okay. free speech. Okay. In fact, Duolingo, for example, is incredibly weak in China, and so are the other big disruptive players in this space. So the second thing I want to do is just to crack this idea of competing with a human being. So I, I want to be able to iterate the app to the point where, you know, if, if you enrolled in a Chinese course for six months with a native Chinese speaker teaching you, you know, coming home and teaching you for an hour a day, and if, yeah. if we were to yeah. if we were to co contrast that with you know spending one hour a day with our app, we would like to make an app which actually delivers better than a teacher. So I think oh. those are the two things oh, yeah. that I want to be able to do with two million dollars. Um, the good news is that I have already found one marquee investor who is willing to put in about half a million dollars. And I don't want to reveal the name of that investor in in the public roundtable, but I can tell you that it is a very prominent. Um, Angel in India who has just recently started a fund, and it's a really big fund. And um, this is a person who has tremendous amount of respect in the industry in India. Plus, he also has very deep connections in China. Um, in his previous avatar, he actually built an entire very successful business out of India in China. So that is super helpful for me, not just as a certain yes. amount of money, but also as a, as a, as a really great way for me. Yeah, yeah, it's smart money. So this, I, I think my timeline is about the end of 2017. I do want to have this compelling product and this one market where I can really take this, uh, hit it out of the ballpark in some sense. And uh, is this investor willing to lead the term sheet? Is that, does that mean if he's willing to put in 500K, has he given you a term sheet? He hasn't given me a term sheet yet. Um, I, I, so, so very uh, speaking in generalities, I, I can I can tell you that he is encouraging me to use that the the power of his brand and the power of his his commitment to actually find like a uh, someone who has tech you know credentials in investing in the tech space you know somebody like an Axel or a or a or a Kofla or somebody like that who could then rally around to get the rest of the money and potentially stick with us over the course of whatever it takes to get this product successful in multiple geographies. So, he's so if you already have a VC in the from your seed round, if you've got 500k yeah. as a term, you know somebody is somebody is willing to put in 500k and 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 lead the term sheet. Your existing investors can't fill this in. Um, the existing investors have committed to certainly putting in as much money as is needed to maintain their flow data. and I am pitching to them. I'm making a full pitch to the to to inventors who is our current investor in a few yeah. days. Yeah. And at that time, I will pitch to them that they will put, they should put in the rest of the money. There, um, I, I mean, the very early signals I got from them is that they would love to put in 
as much money as is needed, but they are not, this is not the kind of business that they, it, it's not a typical business in their portfolio. You know, a technology business with well, a disruptive it's technology. It's not a typical business in anybody's portfolio, Ajit. <laughs> If you look at what the Indian investors are investing in, this is not a typical business in anybody's portfolio. You really need somebody who's confident and, and has some vision to be able to get behind something like this. As you know, you know, you've been in this, you've worked with me for a long time, you know what's going on to some extent at least in the Indian market. They're very, very focused on either B2C deals that are India focused that are mostly in the e-commerce domain or uh, B2B SaaS and you are neither. Right. You're, right. you know, focusing on China and your business model is not clear yet. So, so this is, you know, it is a truly innovative technology play with, you know, with plenty of unknown territory. So you need somebody who has a, a mental model who can absorb something like this. It sounds like you found one guy who has that kind of bold um, thought leadership capability. Right. But you need to look for people like that. It's the run of the mill people in the Indian investor scene are not going to do this deal. Okay. 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 So, what do you think? Um, so I, I guess this is pretty much the last slide. I have a few more slides about team, et cetera, but you know, this is my pitch. Um, where do you think, first of all, where do you think uh, I can strengthen the pitch? And the second question is, uh, any ideas about what kind of investors we're talking about here? You know, the people who are uh, visionaries in technology and who are willing to kind of bet on something like this? I haven't thought, I haven't given this any thought, um, but I will, um, you know, I, I don't know who would be the, that kind of a person, uh, but I will think about it. Um, off the top of my head, the, the regular cast of characters you're not going to get traction from. Okay. That's obvious to me. Because they're operating okay. with a very specific set of uh, assumptions. If you go to, um, you know, a few weeks ago, we had Sasha Mr. Chandani um, as our guest yes. in one of the round tables. And, and if you listen to the first 30 minutes of that conversation, it kind of summarizes what's happening in India, you know? Okay. Okay. Um, the, um, the other option was really to see if I could raise funding in China. I don't know if you have any thoughts about that. Actually, that may be, uh, that may be a more interesting angle or even U.S. investors investing in the Chinese market. There is a bunch of firms like, um, you know, DCM has a big China practice, and there are some other firms that have big China practices. Um, that, may be, that may be a much more interesting angle, actually. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. No, but I, I need to give it some thought. I don't know. Off the top of my head, I'm not sure if there are many investors in India who, are, who have the stomach for this. Okay. okay. You know, and, and investors are mostly operating with a very specific set of criteria, and uh... right, right, <laughs> right. And the other thing is, Ramana, I, I have pitched the idea of language learning to you, and you've given me a lot of very valuable feedback in the past. Um, I'd say mostly critical feedback, but uh, hopefully, I've taken a lot of that feedback and tried to refine that to make things less wishy-washy. Um, do you think this sounds credible? what the vision that I've laid out right now. If not for a series A, then for a, for a seed kind of an investment. Well, um, Ajit, you know my perspective on trying to raise series A without a validated business model, you know, is a, is a really tough thing to do. Yes. And that's what we are trying to do here. So it's not so much my perspective, you know, what I tell you is more a uh, an interpretation of what I'm seeing in the market. I'm not mm -hmm. the one writing the text. You know, if I were playing the role of a VC, I, I would not, you know, many of these constraints that I'm, in, I'm, you know, making you aware of would not be my constraints because I'm an independent thinker. I don't follow, right. I leave. So right. I don't need other people to tell me what to do. 
but but the what I'm telling you is more an interpretation of what the market how the market behaves, how the investors are thinking and so forth, which is why I constantly talk to investors to see what are they thinking and what kinds of, you know, what are what is happening in their heads and, and so forth. So, and from that point of view, from with that hat on, you do have a challenge. Okay. Because you're going into Series A without a validated business model, and that's, that's very tricky. Right, right. Okay. Okay, well, I have to work cut out for me. Thank you for your advice, Samana, and congratulations once again. Look forward to working with You're you in the future as well. Yeah. It's a great pleasure to have worked with you for all this while, and I'll, I keep following what you're doing. Thank you. Kimbra, are you on the call? Maureen, is Kimbra all on the call? Can you hear me? Yes, hi, Kimbra. Samana, can you hear me? Oh, yes, I can hear you. How are you? All right, and you? Wonderful. I'm doing well. Tell us what's you. going on. So, folks, Kimbra is also uh, a long-time uh, one of one premium member, and she's going to provide us with an update. Kimbra, if you could summarize for people what your business is, because, you know, while I know your business intimately, others don't, and then tell us what's up, what's going on. Yeah. Kimber Studios is a photo gifting company. We design and manufacture custom photo products such as jewelry and ornaments and keychains. And um, we've been in business since 1998. And uh, we fulfill um, for our own brand as well as for other OEM um, partnerships. So um, back in 1990, I'm sorry, back in 2003, we were working uh, with, with Kodak and they filed bankruptcy, which really hit our little company hard. It was a six-digit deficit that, um, you know, hit us hard, and, and uh, we struggled to get through that. And then um, in that, I made the decision to outsource manufacturing of our own brand um, for Kimber Studios to a company in California, and that went horribly awry. <laughs> and uh, just – significantly damaged our brand. So we went through, you know, three three years of, of um, just, uh, you know, downsizing and moving facilities and um, quite honestly getting over things as much emotionally as financially. So um, that was a – that's been kind of a journey of, of growth, quite honestly, and learning. And um, so in – um, 2013, we, thank goodness, acquired a very large account, which you helped introduce us into, Sermana, um, and that Shutterfly. And um, <clears throat> since that time, that account has doubled in size each year. Um, oh. So that's been a wonderful account for us. And, and, yeah, last year they added a new jewelry line that we designed and brought to them and it has just, it's been very popular, um, high volume um, product, which, yes, it's wonderful. But the best thing about it is it's not a seasonal, holiday seasonal product like their ornaments that I we see. do. So for us, okay. it's just, yeah, it keeps us more steady. And um, it's, it's been a wonderful account, and they're great people to work with. So um, that's been okay. wonderful. And, um, yep, yeah, and we, uh, the, the, other good thing in that is that it's been able to hire an operations manager. So we brought mm -hmm. him in last fall, and that's been great so that, you know, as, as I can focus more on the product development and the business development side of things because we don't want to be in the scenario again of having all of our eggs in one basket, as you will. So mm -hmm. um, that's been a, a great relief for us. And um, so my focus has switched to, again, um, updating Kimber Studios. We have a new collection coming out in two months um, and updating, you know, just our product line in the, in the website and really focusing on that business and stabilizing that again. And so now the business is stable. The crisis that you went through during the period in the last few years that we worked together, all those major crises Stress is not a problem right now, right? 
Correct. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and, you know, it's just, it's so wonderful to be on the other side of that. And, um, you know, but you learn so much through that. You learn so much by yeah. um, that struggle and, and financially how to handle things. And, you know, we, we, we did go over our million dollar mark last year, so that was super exciting. Right. And it, it brings it 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 brings relief, right? It brings a comfort, yeah. but also um, knowledge in, in how you handle your finances and yeah. and grow it organically and not um, I, I don't know, it's just it's been a huge lesson for me and um, just So Kimbra, what about, about the um, future and what about the point of business development and not having all your eggs in one basket? I imagine right now the business is quite significantly dependent on the Shutterfly account. Um, what are you doing mm -hmm. to mitigate that risk? So we're reaching out um, to other companies as well within um, what we're doing. You know, our product has always been custom-based, photo-based. So people upload yeah. their photos and we put them into products. And the way things are leaning more than just photos is content. So we are mm -hmm. focusing our efforts to grow into content, and it's a strength of ours because design is a strength of ours. So, um, you know, we are at, at the same time of reaching out to other customizable products uh, websites, mm -hmm. we are also working internally on a design factor where we have content that we are bringing into the marketplace and um, mm -hmm. we're finding that that's, that's where things are really growing. Kimber, what about Etsy and Amazon? Are there um, either sellers on Etsy and Amazon that are perhaps doing synergistic stuff where that you can become a back-end supplier to or even have your own Etsy and Amazon presence? Mm -hmm. We are. We do have Amazon. We're, we're actually just working on trying to get that all lined up. I have found that the category part of Amazon can be a little tricky. So that's what we're working on right now. We have not gone, yeah. I think we have a few products on Etsy, um, but we haven't done a lot of that. But again, Amazon is more content based. So say we, you know, we design, a, um, we have our bottle opener um, or a wine stopper and we design something inside of that and we would sell that through Amazon. That seems like more the business model that works well with an Amazon type account. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I think those, that, that point uploading. needs to be uh, explored. I got, I understand where you are, what you're, uh, you, I'm thrilled that things have stabilized and, and you've maneuver, maneuvered well. Um, but actually going forward, you do need to think through the risk diversification point and, uh, and hopefully, you know, open up some of these new possibilities. There are other other possibilities in that space as well to look into, but uh, that should that that is it strikes me just listening to you is that should be one of the agendas going forward. Absolutely. That and we are also we have a a model, a business model that we're working on I'm really excited about that is targeted toward millennials. So um mm -hmm. I just feel like that's um there there's for content there's um definitely room there. Um, to target that group. All right. Well, very good. Thanks for the update. It's great to hear from you, and, and really, I'm absolutely thrilled that things are in a significantly better place at this point. Yes. Thank you so much, Sharmana. It is great catching up with you as well. Likewise. All right. Max Lockwood, you are um, the next presenter. Max? Max, by the way, the first three presenters today have all been through the 1M1M one &one program for several years. So we, are, we have a lot of familiarity of their businesses. So what we did was more catching up on their uh, businesses. Uh, Max and Justin are going to be new presenters. Uh, for the first time, we're going to be listening to them. So Max, please, uh, please tell us what you're working on. All right. Hey, thank you. Um... So this is a brand new idea. This has not been, you know, ground tested. I just, um, I've started a couple of businesses and, and um, I'm sort of at a point where I want to try to start something new. And so I've mm -hmm. gone through a, a thought process. And so 
basically I want to create um, uh, the, the the thought came from visiting, doing a lot of visiting with an Airbnb, a traveler, you know, going to these Airbnb um, mm -hmm. places, talking to people, and coming up with the uh, hearing them talk about how much they love the informal interaction with people. You know, the the, the mm -hmm. they instead of going to a hotel or a bed and breakfast. People can come, and it gives the host an opportunity to meet new people, be creative with how they entertain them. So it's this, this whole new social opportunity for people. And so uh, in my house, uh, I often I love to host potlucks, theme parties, events for people, and um, I find I have a it, it gives me an opportunity to be creative, reach out to different people, reach out to different segments of society. Um, people mm -hmm. love it. Um, and so this idea came up that uh, to create a business that would give people all over, you know, let's just take a city or it could be anywhere all over the world in any type of community, um, an opportunity to host theme, theme-like events, potlucks um, at their homes anytime, daytime, evening, um, and it could be focused on any any subset of the population, it could be for married couples, it could be for elderly people, it could be for all ages, it could be for young people who wanting to meet other young people. Um, it doesn't matter. There's no limits. Um, and so <laughs> the concept would be to, to, like an Airbnb, give offer, an opportunity for people to list themselves on a website uh, or via an app. Uh, as hosts or hosts, hostesses, and then uh, it would give potential customers, um, whether they're travelers or people who are just residents, an opportunity to shop around for events in their respective community or, or communities that they want to visit, uh, an opportunity to shop for things, uh, social interactions that would, you know, put them in touch with folks. Um, and so this, it's, it's kind of so the, the goal is to improve sort of society by having people socialize. And um, if you look at this, this slide here, you know, um, the concept of all people from different communities um, offering events throughout the week, uh, and then it was the customers of those who are going to be potentially participating. Um, Basically, you know, for folks who work hard, who are stressed out, who have busy lives, you know, they want to meet new people, they want to interact, they want to socialize. So this gives them a new avenue to explore, similar to sort of Airbnb. So instead of going to a bar or to a real formal event, this is an organic way for folks to sort of um, come together. Um, so let me just, okay, so the target customer is anybody who lives in a city or who's visiting a city or visiting a community anywhere all over the world. It could be rural, it could be suburban, it could be urban. Um, so the, uh, it'll be, and, and what will separate this from existing models such as Meetup is it would be a fee for service business. So people who are really interested in, in growing their social network and growing their higher quality interaction with other people would pay a fee. And the fee would be, um, just like with Airbnb, it would be totally dependent on the activity that they are interested in. So the more specialized the activity, the more expensive it is, if there's food involved, or the more preparation it takes, the higher the fee. And that would be determined by the host. Um, and this would give the host an incentive to be creative and to sort of up the ante by, you know, creating a really kind of interesting, um, you know, uh, event at their house. So they could charge whatever they think um, the value of the event is. Um, you know, the customer base, how I create that, I put some thought into it. Um, as of right now, I don't have a way to collect emails or specific contacts, so I have to put more thought into that, you know, how I begin to um, create a customer base. I mean, initially I would set up a website and social media, 
um, and just start very, very small. Um, maybe use like where I live, Washington, D.C., as a pilot you know, testing ground. Okay, so Max, I think I've got what you're trying to do. Let me start giving you a bit of feedback. Um, you know, I kind of like the idea, but I, you know, for me, to have feedback from a customer point of view, from a user point of view, for me to use something like this, I actually don't mind paying for it, but I would like to have a very well segmented offering. I don't want to meet random people. I don't have time to meet random people. But within a certain geographic area, I would be interested in meeting other people that fit a very specific profile. And if you give me a way of creating, you know, events and creating and, and being able to connect with a very specific profile of people who are interested also in socializing, I would use this. Wait, say that again. I'm sorry, I got someone called, so I got briefly disconnected. Say that again, real quick. What I said is I would use this if you give me something that is very tightly segmented and very precise. So I actually am interested. I don't have time to socialize with random people. But there's a very specific profile of people in my geography that I would be interested in socializing with and meeting new people who fit that profile. That, so, so for me, the operating word is going to be how precisely can you match make so in that sense, for me, it's not so much Airbnb, but it's more, you know, eHarmony. <laughs> no, I, I like that. I think that's good good feedback. That exactly. I want to I want to make it tighter so that, you know, in your respective community, it would. I would have the, the back end of, of a, you know the back end where I match someone of your profile. So you. Um, See, one of my vision though is not to cut people off. Look, I don't want to cut people off by age or or what have you. I want to. I like the fact that you know my parties. I have people of all age groups, all different backgrounds. No, but that's together. your choice. I may want to cut people off by age group. <laughs> okay. So the so the host. This is where the your host parties can to. be whatever they want to be. My parties need to be the way I want them to be. <laughs> Okay, okay. So, and so the, I agree with you. So that's where I have to, uh, I have to, would I work with hosts then? Would the host be the one in charge, like the people who actually want to host events? They yeah, be because the most people are not comfortable in hosting events of this scale. So, you know, my suggestion is you start looking at next door and start finding people who are willing to act as hosts and start validating how they would do something like this um, in a certain geographic area and, and you know, and, and frankly, next door's categorization is not necessarily the categorization that you have to follow, right? For instance, you know, I live in Menlo Park. I can work with people in the entire San Francisco Bay Area, but I would like it to be very tightly segmented and so forth. So you're going to need to, I think your your ideas I, uh, are there, but it needs to be um you know, like I always think of startups as like a, a ball of clay that you need to kind of sculpt into a piece of art. Um, so, so you have a you have a kind of ball of clay that that has a lot of promise, and and some you know some parts of it has been chiseled and, and sculpted, but you have a lot more sculpting to do still. So. Okay, thank you. That's been great. I'll follow through. Okay. All right. Justin, you're up next. Hi, Shavra. Uh, thanks for this opportunity. And uh, uh, shall we start? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Uh, so as my short uh, bio says, my name is Justin Shavra, based at Delhi NCR, uh, India, and uh, uh, by qualification a law graduate and have been working in the NPO industry for the last two, more than seven years. Uh, 
Uh, so uh, can can we move to the and next LPO question? is legal process outsourcing, folks. Exactly. So the company uh, uh, that I have founded is uh, Revel Legal Support Services. We are an offshore uh, legal support services company. I uh, rather like to call it offshore legal support services than to call it an LPO because uh, the kind of uh, we we are uh, in into this domain, but we are trying to do uh, uh, do uh, these things differently. So our goal uh, is basically uh, similar to to, uh, to the outsourcing industry uh, or the legal outsourcing industry. That is to assist uh, the lawyers and um, other staff assistants and paralegals in our, our law firm, so that they can uh, uh, so, so that they can uh, get um, enough help or enough assistance uh, uh, from uh, from uh, from us uh, in order to increase their billable hours, uh, their communication with the clients, and improving their productivity, uh, uh, their uh, improving their, uh, 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 say, decreasing their turnout times, et cetera. Uh, so uh, that, is, uh, that is it about uh, the concept of this company, or uh, I would say the goal of our company. Yes, uh, mm -hmm. thank you. The target market we are targeting small and mid-level uh, law firms of Australia. When I say small and mid-level law firms, uh, we have categorized them. Uh, so the law firms which have uh, around two to four partners or uh, between five to 20 employees. So we are categorizing uh, them as small and mid-level law firms. And uh, the services that we uh, are offering them are legal drafting. Uh, that is typically uh, drafting uh, court documents such as affidavits, petitions, uh, applications, claims, uh, licensing with clients, licensing with third parties, licensing with any relevant party uh, to a matter. Then case management. Case management includes several things uh, such as briefing the counsels, um, uh, creation of new um, uh, new matters, new electronic matters rather, and uh, filing uh, uh, electronically filing uh, the court documents. Uh, and then administrative tasks, which could be uh, account management, uh, billing, and following up with the clients uh, for the debt management. So uh, okay. these are the services that we are we, that we are going to provide them. Uh, and uh, the the focus that we uh, the reason that we are focusing on uh, the Australian market are the recent studies that uh, uh, several different agencies have been conducting uh, with respect to the legal industry, the challenges of the legal industry uh, in Australia. Uh, it is basically the lawyers, the principal lawyers, as well as other associates in a law firm, they do not get enough time to, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, uh, uh, the work-life balance is uh, not, not very good. Uh, in fact, there were studies which say that uh, uh, typically a lawyer works uh, for around 60 hours a week. So uh, mm -hmm. that is the pain point that we can, of course, help them uh, with. Uh, okay, so you have already moved to the next slide. Uh, can can we please uh, uh, go back to the previous slide? Uh, uh, actually, I wanted to uh, just to, uh, communicate this point that uh, what are their challenges that uh, um, I have in my uh, research so far found it, and how uh, we are going to help them. Uh, so as I said that they have uh, uh, lesser time. Uh, this is um, uh, work-life balance is one thing and uh, business expansion is also there uh, because the principal lawyer, he uh, has to work towards uh, client management as well as uh, law firm management. So uh, he needs to have enough time to take care of all these things apart from uh, his day-to-day -day work that he as a lawyer does. So uh, with us on board, uh, they they can get uh, uh, we we are uh, actually uh, focusing uh, to uh, you know uh, uh, focusing to uh, provide a defined uh, number of hours that we can stay per day, per week, or per month uh, for them. Uh, and these these hours are actually billable hours. Because uh, as a concept, we are lawyers uh, working for lawyers, and we will be doing all the work that a lawyer uh, uh, does in Australia. Captain, you need to client. move a little faster because we are running out of time. Um, we understand you're trying what you're trying to do. You understand that you're trying to do this for the Australian market and, and so forth. So, 
it looks like your primary differentiation is cost-based. What else do you want to convey here? Uh, well, uh, see, A, it is, yes, of course, cost is uh, differentiation. And apart from that, uh, what I can see here is there is a huge pipeline, which is, I would say, it is, uh, it is not untapped. I, I, um, uh, I didn't find anything which would say that it is untapped. However, I am not assuming that it is untapped. But still, uh, uh, the, the LPO industry is mainly focusing on professional services, as I have outlined there, that uh, uh, the services uh, or the backend services for corporates or corporate law firms. So they have a defined uh, set of services, such as... So you are saying you want to... Let me see if I got it. You, you're saying that you want to cater to individual lawyers or small law offices? And, and become their yes, back end exactly. as opposed to corporate law or uh, cor large corporate uh, law practices or um, legal departments of corporations? Uh, yes. Uh, for small okay. law firms, which are non corporate. Uh, and <clears throat> I like that. I like that positioning. Okay. And in fact, the services that we are providing, uh, those are catering to the day-to-day -day service, uh, the day-to-day -day work that they do, apart from uh, project based or apart from yeah. a bundle of documents need to be reviewed. Uh, these are recurring yeah. uh, work. Yeah, okay. So, yeah. so uh, uh, that, is, that is our value propositioning, and uh, I am actually, uh, the main challenge that I am facing uh, is into marketing. Um, uh, there are two approaches which I have identified. Uh, one is um, uh, that typical cold calling thing, uh, uh, listing, uh, 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 making a list of clients and uh, approaching them either by email or LinkedIn or by telephone calls directly. Or otherwise, uh, the other uh, approach that I have is by building a network in Australia. Uh, I have few friends uh, or um, perhaps um, uh, we, we can build a network uh, wherein people who are based in Australia can refer me to a lawyer or a law firm. Because, see, apart from small law firms, uh, uh, I am all, uh, I'm also focusing on the areas that those law firms are based. Uh, I am uh, trying to figure out which law firms are based in suburban or rural areas. Because mm -hmm. those are the areas where they have, where, where they are uh, actually finding it tough uh, to uh, uh, recruit people, or even if they get people, it is very difficult to retain them. So uh, mm -hmm. there we can help them big time. So uh, that is our current direction. We uh, were founded so last what year. Is, and what does that mean? You, you are currently working on this full time? Is this business you're working full time, or yes. you have your job still? No, I am working uh, with the first full time. We have, and, we have um, a paying clients. And how did you get this paying client? Uh, actually, through a friend, he referred. Um, I have a friend in Australia who uh, referred me to this person, and we got in touch. And I presented him uh, my proposal, etc. Okay. And uh, then things went positive. Okay. So we are working for him. And what size client is this? How much do you make from this client on a monthly basis? Uh, it is 1400 Australian dollars. Okay. All right. So I'll answer your questions. Um, you know, we follow a whole methodology of how to build a business. And um, mm -hmm. we don't introduce you to people who will help you with marketing. We teach you how to market. That's a very different approach than... We don't refer you to other consultants. That's just not what we do. We teach you how to build a business. And, um, okay. and similarly, we teach you how to develop these networking opportunities in Australia, what strategies, what scalable strategies, what repeatable strategies get you to those kinds of situations. So we teach you marketing. We teach you business development. We teach you customer acquisition all of those things, and, and, and that's really what this program is about. We are not really, uh, we are not in the business of re referring you to consultants. Okay. Okay? So if you hang on, I'm going to explain to you how to use the one-on-one -on -one program next, actually. 
and, and then you can ask me questions after that. So folks, um, that concludes our uh, mentoring portion of the session today. And um, if you like what we're doing here in One Million by One Million, uh, please refer other serious entrepreneurs to the program. We're always looking for serious entrepreneurs. We're always looking for referrals. And the opportunity to work with serious entrepreneurs is important because, you know, if this is, as you can see, as you heard from the first three people, first three presenters who have been, you know, in the program for many, many years. So it's, it takes many years to build a company. This is not an overnight thing. This is not a, something that is fly by night. So we want those kinds of entrepreneurs who will be building companies over lengthy periods of time. Um, all our resources are at 1mby1m.com. You'll find a, a terrific blog that you can follow and learn a lot from. The Entrepreneur Journeys book series, there are 12 volumes of it. You'll learn a ton from those. They're case study-based books. And uh, if you dig around on the website, there's a ton of information. These roundtables happen every week. This is, as I said, our 300th roundtable. And we will be here week after week after week. And you can come and use this as a working session and learn from um, you know, both your peers as well as from us and um, see where you can make changes and accelerate your journey. Um, we also have the one on one premium program, which is a $1,000 annual membership fee for extensive methodology guidance, a great curriculum that is video lectures and case study based. We help you with business development and strategy consulting. We also help you with financing and media relations. Um, if you go to the one million, uh, the homepage of 1M1M, you'll find the Million Dollar Club where you will encounter case studies and success stories of the 1M1M entrepreneurs. We have an ROI equation on the homepage as well, quantifying the 1M1M value equation. That's $375,000 plus 5 to 10% equity worth of value for just $1,000 annual membership fee. I talked about the self-assessment earlier. Um, please, if you are looking to get the methodology under your belt, any of these, this customer acquisition or, or financing or market sizing or bootstrapping, whichever piece that you want to, want to get under your belt or if you're trying to get under your belt multiple pieces, consider just joining the one on one basic curriculum only option is just and you will be able to learn a lot just by going through that curriculum material. And um, in any case, so all the ex details about the premium program and the basic program are on the website. There are lots of video FAQs. You can dig around and um, familiarize yourself with the program. As I said earlier, methodology is bootstraps, lean capital efficient startups. Bootstrap first, raise money later is the mantra. And um, you can basically sign up to pitch at any of the next um, roundtables in April. Every week we have a session. Let Maureen, let, you know, register on the website and Maureen will send you the instructions. Uh, Vision India 2020 is the 13th book from the one and one and platform that's uh, got $45 billion business ideas and you're welcome to steal, borrow, morph, mash up any of them with any of them and do whatever you want with them. Um, that's pretty much all I want to share with you today. Um, we are way over time. However, this is the 300th round table and I cannot let, um, you know, cannot not offer to take questions. So if you would like to ask a question either in public chat or by calling in, please feel free. And we are going a bit over today, time-wise. Anybody? Questions, comments, issues? And while you're doing that, let me also reiterate that you can call Irina anytime or email her and ask questions about the 1M1M one &one program. She's very patient and she will handhold you through whatever you need to understand. Anybody, any questions, any comments? And Maureen is offering you the 1M1M one &one basic link. So if you are considering doing the curriculum to accelerate your learning, please go to 
one on one and basic and uh, sign up there. Anybody else? Questions, comments? Folks, it's been a pleasure to share this milestone event with you. And um, I hope to continue working with many of you over the upcoming sessions. And uh, my colleagues, Maureen and Irina, are the ones who are going to be in touch with you. Both of them have been instrumental and, and tremendously active in bringing this programming to you for so many years. And, um, and from all of us, we wish you the very best. We look forward to continuing to work with you. And uh, come back. Bye, everybody. Thank you for coming today.